All right, hello and welcome back to Lunch of the Market. What a weekend it was, and no, we're not just talking about Florida State and Duke surviving March Madness, but with the Allied forces uh, having Libya under wraps, and it appears that Japan is on top of their nuclear situation. There's a ton going on in the world that is right today. All that means, combined with AT&T's acquisition of T-Mobile, owned by Deutsche Telekom, we... We've got a merger Monday on top of all kinds of bullish news coming out of the weekend. Well, that is if you're a Florida State or Duke fan. I guess a Carolina fan, too, but hopefully uh, one of the other teams in the turn will take care of them soon. Now, with lots of good things on the radar, here's what's coming up. Only three weeks away from second quarter earnings. It starts in earnest on April 11th with Alcoa, Bank of America, Regions Financial, Outsourcing Technology, iGate, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and KFC owner Yum Brands. All right, we'll know a lot about how the world looks after we get earnings out of these players on April 11th. We're going to know everything from the health of the U.S. consumer and the housing and mortgage market here in the United States, growth and recovery of business spending on efficiency tools from iGate, local economies uh, and local demand, loan demand from FHN, the health of the heavy industrial manufacturing community from Alcoa, and the strength of the worldwide consumer from Yum Brands. They have a huge China business and a huge South America business, so we're going to get to know a ton from those five companies. That's in three weeks on a Monday, which is April 11th. All right, so bullish news coming out of the weekend. Only three weeks away from earnings season where we're going to know a ton about uh, the health of the entire world economy right out of the gate on the 11th. Now, now that you know what we're, we have coming up on the horizon, what's going on today and what are we doing? Well, we're doing trade repair. I know, I know, right? It's the first day of April OPEX, and we're already doing trade repair. Well, uh, <laughs> Magnum Opus Financial non-favorite, F5 Networks, FFIV, was absolutely terrible. The stock, which was trading around 106 in the pre-markets on Friday, closed at about 96 or $10 lower after the session. Uh, it was absolutely hideous and a bloodbath. We basically took our entire position in F5 and just simply rolled it out to April just so we could deal with it when we got back. We had to invest like a monster. Uh, the VIP session was that Friday. There was a ton going on with other stocks like Deckers and Salesforce.com they were trying to get rid of. So the easiest thing to do was just to move it out on the calendar and deal with it when we got back to the office. So now that we're back today, we have to deal with F5. So what did we do? We came in short the April 105-100 put spreads, right? So our short put is at 105. Our long put is at 100. Clearly, with the stock trading at around $96 and change, we're already busted. And there's no real reason to be our hero on this thing because the chart on the stock looks absolutely hideous. And if you're following on Twitter, at Fibline, you already know that the point and figure chart said the F5 is a sale. Okay, so with tons of bearish news backed up against uh, our holding of F5 or our short holdings on F5, what do we do? We doubled up our position and rolled down and out. So we're short 105, 100, boom, rolled down and out to the May 95, 90s, and only had to double the size of the position. We are down $10 a share, or two strike prices lower from where we were short going into March OPEX. And so now we've got a couple months, and really we won't do a ton with this. Now, if for some reason the stock busts through 95 and starts to look absolutely hideous, meaning it's going to go back to something like 40, and what we'll do is that we'll take our entire position, roll it way out on the calendar, and start going attacking the front month. Right? So the goal to do trade repair is to try to make as much money in between now and when our options will ultimately expire. This is what happened to us on Goldman Sachs. We thought we had a handle on it. The SEC's lawsuit on Goldman Sachs blew up uh, Goldman Sachs, went from like 170 to 130. I think it broke 130 at one point. We basically threw those all the way out on the calendar to the very next year and then worked on trade repair in the meantime. And then it took us about six months to be profitable on the trade. And then, it, funny, uh, March, the 130 spreads that we had uh, sold you know, forever ago finally came off uh, just this last past Friday. And so we're out of our Goldman Sachs position uh, totally, although we did say under 60 buy it. And that was an excellent entry point. Um, we'll take a quick look at where Goldman trades today. If you had gotten in below 160 where we said, you'd be sitting pretty right now. Uh, it's just above, it's over 160, although if we pull up the chart and take a look at the last, 
say 10 days of trading on Goldman Sachs, you had a shot to pick up Goldman at about $154 a share. And so if you sat around and waited until it broke the 160 level, which we identified, and then got in around 154, 155, then you're up uh, a quick five points, almost six points uh, from the lows. So not a bad trade at all. We do still like Goldman longer term, and we do still think that if you, every time you get a shot below 160 on Goldman Sachs, you can take a shot from the long side. All right, so today's really all about F5. It's our Goldman for, uh, for 2011. We're going to stay with the trade for, you know, it's going to be months and months and months it takes to get out of this. Uh, if you don't have any trade in F5 right now at all, the easiest trade is the bearish trade. So try putting on something like a, a 95, 85, 75 put butterfly, where you're you're essentially long 95, 85 uh, put spread, and then you're short an 85, 75 put spread below it. Or you can tighten up the strikes on it if you want to. But essentially, it's a bearish bet. Their earnings are going to come out on April the 20th, so you may need to play the May expiration in order to get the bang for your buck that you need out of that. Um, I'd have to take a look and see let's see if we can find out real quickly when options expiration is in uh, April to know whether or not the 20th is going to get us covered. My suspicion is that options will expire before they report uh, 26 days. I've got to pull out a calendar to see when that is, but my gut says that April OPEX will be before earnings. So if you're planning on them doing a terrible job on earnings, then you're going to want the put butterfly to be for May so that you can capture that event. Being that, er that OPEX should be before earnings, you might have an opportunity actually to sell some spreads and get out ahead of earnings um, in F5 networks, unless uh, obviously something gets leaked. But take a look at seeing what we can do in trade repair. We'll take a, a further look at F5 networks to see what we can do in the meantime while we just twiddle our thumbs and wait for May OPEX to come around for us to get rid of those put spreads that were short. Okay, now, what are some of the reasons why we want to stay in the trade? Well, on the day that F5 blew up from 140 to about 105, there was uh, about 23.2 million shares of F5 networks traded. Just to give you an idea, the average trading volume on F5 is around 3.5 million shares. So when the, when the volume on the stock hit 23.2 million shares, that's about 6.6 .6 times the average daily volume. You know, we felt comfortable at the time going in, and it looked like a great bet as F5 traded all the way back up to 120 before it just absolutely fell out of bed and rolled over. So the moral of the story there is when your short spreads, especially on a massive gap down like we were, then when the stock trades back up and you're really profitable on your spreads, don't wait all the way until expiration to take those things off the table. If you're in the 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent profit region, go ahead and take those suckers off because obviously the risk at that point is to the downside, which we clearly saw on F5 last Friday. The stock acted okay heading into options expiration and then just absolutely fell out of bed on the last day. The last thing you want to do is turn a profitable trade into an absolutely monster loser trade the last day of options expiration. So sometimes it's time to wave the white flag ahead of options expiration and not get the 100% profit mark. Okay, so last Friday you might ask what was the volume? 8.58 million shares or 2.45 times average daily volume. Look, with all this bearish firepower basically expelled or uh, used up, the, uh, the impetus is on the bears to continue this down slide because we're running out of big sellers of the stock. Currently, as of December 31st, if you take a look at Yahoo Finance's major holders tab on the left-hand side, you'll see that Vanguard, State Street, Wells Fargo, American Century, Amer Ameriprise Financial, and BlackRock are the biggest holders out of the top 10. Fidelity also holds three out of the top 10 mutual funds that have positions in F5. Now, we'll find out sometime in April when we see what the quarter looked like at the end of March 31st, exactly who was part of those 23 million shares that blew out and hit the sell button. That's going to give us a good idea as to whether or not we think the institutional ownership is still behind F5 or whether or not we should be extremely concerned. So, uh, keep in mind that that event will be coming up sometime in April. So the quarter will close on March 31st and then X number of days afterwards um, those numbers will be updated and we'll get an idea as to who is still holding F5. Okay, and now trades with a Ford PE of only 21, and they're growing year-over-year -year earnings growth at 90% a clip. If the company can keep its torrid pace of growth, 
then we haven't seen the name of this. We have not seen the end of this name forever. So be careful with the stock. Right now, the trend is clearly against you. Okay, there's some good work by at Fibline. So follow him on Twitter and check out the stuff that he's put out there. If you don't have a position now, the easiest position is probably going to be a May put butterfly to capture what could be another terrible earnings number. If an upside surprise happens, then it's easy to repair that that trade on F5. You just turn your um, your put butterfly into two short put spreads, right? Boom, boom. This short put spread should be way out of the money, already profitable. Then you layer in another one atop that, and then you ride it till expiration. But if you're right and the bearish trend continues, then you should be able to take off the put butterfly as long as the damage isn't massive, meaning blows all the way through both wings of the butterfly. As long as it goes down to you know your body of the butterfly, then you should be in great shape. You'll make a lot of money there, uh, and then you could take it off and move on and be done with it. For us, we'll manage this trade to profitability just like we did with Goldman Sachs. We're probably going to take a look at selling some call spreads soon, especially if we can see an up day in the name. Thanks for joining us today on Lunch of the Market. Have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow.